Guys, I have one of the best deals ever on the channel for you all today. So today's reaction video is sponsored by Private Internet Access. And not only are you able to get this VPN with a 30-day money-back guarantee, but with my code, you get 83% off, $2 a month. Uh, for using my code, which will be down in the description. Let me tell you about these guys real quick, right? So obviously a VPN service allows you to browse the web much safer. You have encrypted data. You can get past region blocks for content by VPNing to areas that like, for example, certain shows are restricted in your area. You can VPN to the area that has them. You can overcome ISP throttling as well. If your ISP throttles you, which we're not surprised if that happens, but it's just a safer way to browse the internet. Not only do these guys let you use it on unlimited devices, right? You can use it on any device. It's, it's compatible with anything. They have over 30 million downloads worldwide. And they let you use it anywhere, give you a money-back guarantee, and you can get 83% off for $2 a month using my code down in the description. Guys, this is an unbelievable deal, right? It is an unbelievable deal. This is the best VPN service that I've ever really seen. I mean, there are 50 servers in all 50 states. You can connect to any streaming service. You can connect to personal apps. You can increase your speeds and lower your ping depending on where you are. And look, guys, I'll, I'll be real. I've never seen a VPN deal this good. And you guys know what we like to do. Win, win, win. Right, we create a win for you, a win for me, and win for the business. So definitely check these guys out. If you don't like it, again, it's free for 30 days. You can just, you know, say no. But I think you're going to considering what they offer is so good. So thank you, Private Internet Access, for sponsoring today's video. You're not going to find a better VPN deal, guys. And again, they're trusted by 30 million people across the world. So go check them out. It helped me out. It helped you out. It helped them out. Win, win, win. Thanks for the video. Let's go get into the death of Overwatch 2. Guys, let's get right into this. Here we go. Death of a game, Overwatch 2. I love this series. I want to say to start. I'm very curious what angles they're going to go for here. But Overwatch 2, an all new sequel to the world famous world igniting Overwatch 1 that was set to introduce an all new PVE and hero mode component to the game in a way never done before. Well, True. that was the tagline and the thesis of it all. That's not where things ended up, as all of you are probably well aware of after reading the title of this video. No, you see, it turns out after the game has been reportedly in the works since 2019, Overwatch 2 has been basically canceled. And there it were there were murmurs of of this before, by the way. You know, I I think the first, I, I, like you know, I, I, there were murmurs like 2018, 2019 about like what was going to happen, but like it's definitely they definitely been working on it since 2019. Yes, there will sure. be fans in chat discussing how the PvP mode is still existing and counters this notion. But the entire point of Overwatch 2 was the new PVE hero mode and content. Hundreds of missions, hero missions, and cooperative content, mostly if not all, gone. And yet, here we are. Blizzard is seemingly bent on pretending that nothing happened. With their recent showcase at the Xbox Game Show, where to be they fair, that's what they have to do, though. PvE content they can't just stop, you know? But I won't pretend it didn't happen. I was there testing Overwatch since closed beta, and I got to top 500 and even won a LAN tournament. I was in the trenches, and seeing the foregoing of development <laughs> of Overwatch 1 for another game was puzzling even back then. If this is Overwatch 2, a major sequel, it might be one of the worst, highest profile ones we have ever seen. In I, I think it is. All things encompassed. I, I think that I, I can't think of a quote unquote sequel of a mainstream title that was a, as much of a failure as Overwatch 2 was. Because nothing is in this game. Like, again, it lost features, right? And I know people are sitting there saying, well, the PvE is still coming out. Yeah, but, like, we were getting those campaign missions in Overwatch 1. You have to ask yourself, what explicitly new did Overwatch 2 offer? And it's really just the monetization, which is, like, again, the game had to go free-to-play. It did. It's with the comp that's I know people like to complain about the monetization, and sometimes it is a bit ridiculous, but the game had to go free-to-play. All of its competitors are free-to-play. It had this to do it. This is quite clearly Detective's a special episode. I mean, I've already got the jazz going, and I don't even think we have ever gone through a timeline like this before, with such preconceived notions of chaos and failure wrapped up so deeply into everything. But that's because Overwatch 2 was a colossal failure, and despite what white knighters in the comments might try, keyword, to argue, this entire video is going to be dedicated yeah, the to the white knighting for Overwatch 2 is pretty cringe. Historical I won't timeline lie. and evidence we gather along the. I I've seen some creators like trying to blame uh, creators for the big narrative around the game, and I'm just like, guys, that is absurd. But again. It's it's mostly from from like the internal part of like the Overwatch side of streamers who are like Overwatch loyalists, which I understand why they would be. You know, it's 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 fine. But anybody anybody from the outside looking in on this game knows exactly what happened. Here. Journey: the various failures of the game culminating to a colossal one just recently. So strap in, detectives. We have quite the story to unravel here. 
To disclaim things too, my allegiances are to the betterment of the gaming industry as a whole. To everyone asking me to be less mean or critical, well, I'm just letting you know that that's utterly trite and not utility-like in reaching my goal. Detectives have never really been universally liked. I mean, we're shaking cupboards and pulling back rugs. I love the theme all. of this series. Anyway, he's done a great job. It's very things. clever. You guys personally it's requested clever. this investigation. Oops. Since shock starts with the previous title, Overwatch One, the mere announcement of a sequel would send shockwaves through the community. Not just because of the hype and possibilities, but because Overwatch 1 was only a few years old at this point, and at that point had been largely abandoned in terms of large or even moderate updates. So what's so crazy is I remember the moment, I remember the moment I heard about Overwatch 2, and it was, uh, I, I got invited to BlizzCon, this is right after my, I qualified for contenders, right, and I was talking to one of my streamer friends, who I won't say who, and she had heard that like yeah like they're doing overwatch too because she was good friends with like a lot of the big big streamers at the time this is like right when my channel was really starting to come up like i was starting to get like 1k viewers on youtube but i was streaming on youtube and no everyone else was streaming on twitch like tim was still playing the game like what well, well actually no tim had moved to fortnite but you know it was still like a big game and i heard overwatch too and my th first my initial thought was why why like why not just do it in overwatch that doesn't make sense like why make it be like making league of legends too <laughs> and i guess you know, my initial input was right, because here we are five years later, right? You know, or four years later. Crazy. This much was admitted by Overwatch's director, Jeff Kaplan, later on. But the whole idea was that Overwatch 1 was on the rocks because... Actually, four years ago today, I was in my contender season. Two behind my the first scenes, one. And it was going to change everything. Crazy. Time flies. Overwatch man. 2 would be finally capitalizing on the long-standing and incredibly well-done lore and art that Overwatch featured for many years, including the trailers and the different shorts. Dragons. With the addition of the game now having the a best story mode that could... Second best game trailer of all time, Dragons. ...leverage this. This would include Skyrim. story missions, unique hero missions for each hero, and according to Forbes, Overwatch 2 was set to have reportedly hundreds of co-op missions. As for the PvP players, they would experience new visuals, a new game mode dubbed Push, new heroes, and the change of 6 players to 5 players now, making the game 5 vs 5. Nearly two years would pass and Overwatch 2 was seemingly no closer to launch. While it's expected for a game to have taken time for development, announcing it clearly so early on was putting pressure on the game. And worse, Overwatch 1 wasn't being updated or properly handled anymore. So much so that Blizzard was even admitting such. Worst of all, not only was the development on Overwatch 2 stalling True. behind the scenes, struggles over scope and scale on the project were raging on. The game director himself, Jeff Kaplan, the voice and face of Overwatch, would be leaving Blizzard during this struggle after 19 years of development history. Aaron Keller, who previously led the level design team on Team 4 for Blizzard and Overwatch, would take over as the game director. Funny enough, though, his LinkedIn still says that he's a level designer, though. Jeff Kaplan leaving was a major blow to not just Overwatch, but the coming of Overwatch 2. Many people would theorize that Overwatch 2 was Jeff's plan and vision to the realization, to see the realization of what was Project Titan, Titan yeah. the previously failed online FPS project that from its ashes would birth Overwatch. Many people felt that with his departure, that dream officially died. That being said, there is also an insane amount of character worship that goes on in America, and specifically with Jeff Kaplan. That is true. Now, it's less that he's secretly this bad developer that I'm going Je to- Jeff Kaplan is like the gaming industry's like sweetheart, you know? <laughs> I, don't know I don't know how to, I don't know how to explain it. I don't know how to explain it. I like the guy. I didn't always agree with him, but I like the guy. The kind of game and money that Activision Blizzard was trying to make, perhaps Jeff was just the wrong tool. With more time and resources, he was. could Jeff maybe have accomplished his vision? Perhaps, but the this deck was stacked too against too much of a difference. Kotick took over Blizzard, and well, Which after you see of what became of the monetization for Overwatch 2, it's hard not to see it as a battle that Kaplan ultimately lost, whatever the true story might be. While 2021 would be a quiet year for Overwatch 2 and its coming progress, it wasn't a quiet year for the developer and publisher behind the game, Activision Blizzard. In the summer of 2021, multiple harassment suits would be levied against the company with real credible backing and evidence. Uh, to, the California to, to, Department of Fair... To be fair, Team 4 had literally zero implications to this. So I, I want to make it really clear that Team 4, at, like that, that, at the Blizzard side, the Overwatch side, had... There wasn't a single complaint. Women and Housing would release a 29 page complaint. So, this really is this is more so about Activision Blizzard, but it does, it is important. It ties into the story, Activision I guess. Blizzard. 
Activision Blizzard, from all accounts and purposes, was a toxic frat boy culture who had become so powerful and big-headed in their success in video games that the company felt that they could just display their misogyny and bro culture at the workplace. Brazenly, even. The chickens were coming home to roost, though. The backlash was so bad that the major advertisers that were involved in the AL, or the Overwatch League, were pulling out by the fall of 2021. Now this could be seen as convenient timing as the pro scene and the viewership numbers therein weren't very impressive. To, to be honest, I, I, my gut is telling me that a lot of these sponsors, right, like the league was already doing poorly and I think they were just looking for a reason to leave, right? Because the league numbers just were not doing what it was supposed to do. So, I mean, again, it's like this, that was kind of their excuse. Like, oh, this business is not doing well. And as very clearly Overwatch League has not as we've seen as time's gone on, the big announcements of them having to give back money and settling with the with the teams like the, the league was a failure right I, I honestly you know i have a pretty big conclusion to come to at the end of this video but we'll talk about but it when major advertisers don't want to associate with you anymore it means that you're losing in the eye if they were making money the advertisers Despite wouldn't care the developmental drama and drama surrounding that's the just how it works itself, overwatch 2 would continue on with a closed beta april 26th 2022 the launch date was also announced for later in the year in October. There was also more details concerning the switch to 5 vs 5 and how that would now only feature one tank. The biggest drama yet concerning Overwatch 2 itself, not Activision Blizzard and the development team, would be related to the monetization of the game. Due to European law and pressure globally, Activision Blizzard was forced to redo their approach with loot boxes. This was a perfect opportunity for them to devise a new scheme to make money off of their customers, new or old. With the Battle Pass system, new heroes like the support character Kiriko would now be locked behind requiring players to greatly progress it, through it and or purchase the Battle Pass. It's, if, if it's to not- make matters worse, people did the math on how long it would take to grind both problem. Kiriko herself and all of her cosmetics, and the math was staggeringly high, reportedly taking five years of grinding at a normal pace to complete- Wait, is that right? Can someone in the comments let me know if that's that doesn't seem right to me hold on a second that doesn't seem right to me it wasn't five years no way that can't be right that there's no way that i'm looking at that number i'm seeing that that cannot be right five years i don't know about Please. that Previously, Overwatch was a box price with loot boxes for skins, but to be honest, as a longtime player, most of the other longtime players like me already had most of the skins that they wanted without having to spend money. With the new system, heroes would be locked behind a paywall, bringing a different sort of monetization the game had never seen well, before. Well, it's a pay and play wall, to be fair. It, there was a, fee, a free track on the Battle Pass. My issue is that, like, one, they should be unlocking heroes automatically at the end of the season. Instead, they're selling them later, right? So you're starting to get to a point when players are coming into the game, especially in the competitive mode, where, like, characters are just locked. And again, th this is kind of like a sweet spot they have to find. But, again, for example, Junker Queen was just, like, hard meta, right? Like, a season two ago, like, in my Quitting Overwatch video, like, I haven't, where I've only streamed the game, I think, twice in, like, the past month. Um, I said this, like, Junker Queen is meta right now, and if you didn't get it back then, you know, it takes, like, a ridiculous amount of time to unlock the character. Like, the, the unlock speed for these characters that have already been out, that they're trying to milk for money, is taking away from the integrity of the game. And it, it, it's a sweet spot to balance. Again, heroes are the content of Overwatch. I'm, I'm not, I don't mind new heroes being behind the battle pass for, like, a week or two. Right? But, like, it's too difficult to unlock them over time. And that's the problem. In competitive shooters, hero shooter or not, players have felt that... And it's a competitive a shooter. ...a hero behind a paywall isn't fair due to needing to play with, as them, or against them in ranked play. It makes the game... If it was a casual game, like it wouldn't matter. ...to put simply. And Blizzard's reasoning for locking heroes behind a paywall was simple, and they even admitted it quite clearly. Because it was the single most engaging content. They knew exactly what they were doing and yeah, why they were doing it, and it how sense. it was skewed to making them more money. More bad news would strike in September of 2022 in the way of losing more key important talent. This time, the lead hero designer, Jeff Goodman. Jeff not only had been balancing and helping create heroes since the original game came out, he was responsible for the most recent reworks of Orisa, Doomfist, as well as the new heroes that were added to the game. To say losing him was a major blow was an understatement. Look, Jeff Goodman's a great guy, but to say that Jeff Goodman leaving was a bad thing, I think is ridiculous. The, the dude made Brigida, Bap, Moira, Double Shield, all of those problems for years before. Like, like somebody's accountable. Like, listen, Overwatch 2 is a mess, right? 
But let's not pretend that Overwatch 1 was not taken in the wrong direction, and it was specifically because of the design models of Kaplan and Goodman, right? Again, it's they're, they're not as bad as, like, all of Activision out there, like, with their, you know, everything that they've done, but... To, to uh, let's not act like that the direction this game went in a hero design and balance wise was good for years. It was infamously bad, the worst in the gaming industry. So I, I think that he's wrong on this one. And but. no reason was given as to why he departed either. Just like Jeff Kaplan, trending towards problems behind the scenes, right? No, I disagree on that one. Overwatch 2 would launch October 4th, 2022 after though. nearly three to four years in development in parallel as they were maintaining the live services on Overwatch 1. The critical reviews, which is what we will start with, were probably as expected, glossing over many of the negative aspects we covered in the pregame in lieu of focusing on the game itself. I will talk more about the player reception of the game later. PC Gamer in their review of Overwatch 2 would score the game a 74 out of 100 and say that Overwatch 2 could have launched as a much better game and a much more ambitious one. Like the original in 2016, it could have been an like, FPS again, with sort of players and skill sets that other shooters don't offer. They could have just for. been updating Overwatch 1 this entire time and working on PvE on the side. Though, again, I think apparently the engine of Overwatch 1 wouldn't support the PvE, but again, these are all, I don't know, you, you didn't need to stop Overwatch 1, I don't think. sacrifices its best parts no. as it transitions to a free-to-play model. The original Overwatch is too robust and too distinct to be completely erased, and it's why the sequel remains compelling in spite of itself. But the live service model leaves it in a fragile state. Close as it is to a fully reinvigorated sequel to one of the best shooters of the last decade, it's just as close to collapsing as the pillars of its original design get knocked out. IGN was rather positive concerning Overwatch 2. Overwatch 2 breathes new life into what was once the sharpest multiplayer shooter around, before it had its edges severely dueled by Blizzard's attention shifting away. The switch to smaller 5v5 sure. matches ushers in a new brawler age for Overwatch where individual duels take precedence over tactical team play. And crucially, all but a handful of shields have been thrown out of the I arena. miss 2018 the Overwatch are all set so for Overwatch much, to dude. shine as it once did in the multiplayer shooter scene once again. And the future definitely looks bright with what is set to come. It really was just months. such a good game. Leaving their review on a slight bit of a cliffhanger, many people in the comments are probably chuckling about right now. Where the reviews actually start getting critical <laughs> is with Eurogamer and Polygon's review of Overwatch 2, starting with Eurogamers. Going by its launch showing, I suspect Overwatch 2 will continue to stumble occasionally with its representational politics. The wider question is, where is it stumbling to? I'm not privy to the detail of Blizzard's forthcoming co-op modes, but let's be honest. We've seen Overwatch do PvE before, and it's never felt like more than a nice distraction. The PvP is still some of the best multiplayer you can find this side of Smash Bros and Team Fortress, but all of those incremental True. additions create a sense of dying by inches. I would rather play a proper Street Fighter 4-esque sequel which shucks off or transforms the original frameworks entirely. As things stand today, Overwatch 2 feels like yet another service game where unlocks lead off into perpetuity, purely because money has to be made. It's got its yeah. eyes on the horizon, the same old spring in its step, but I'm not sure it has anywhere to go. That's so While true. Was that is quick. such a great way of putting it. It's still got the spring in its step, but it doesn't have anywhere to go. I agree with that 100%. Like, Overwatch, it just didn't innovate. It did, like, everyone else and every other big title innovated while they were going in a good direction. And Overwatch, I think, was going in the wrong direction and not innovating. Uh, to a, jump to conclusions for the game, they were also worried about the game even being delivered as promised. Nailed it, Polygon. Enjoying Overwatch 2 is an exercise in cautious optimism, not just in the future direction of its ever-changing lore and world, but in the idea that years of new content will ultimately deliver on the promise of a full sequel. Overwatch 2, drama and all, would eclipse an impressive 35 million players. Mind you, the game was free to play now, so a higher player count was kind of to be expected, but still, that was something to work with and incredibly impressive. But how long would those players stick around for? On top of a normal online gaming bleed, Overwatch 2's numbers would be dropping no matter what because the game was technically in early access. It was missing the promised PvE, which was the whole selling point of the game. At launch, Overwatch 2 was more focused on being this lean, slight overhaul shift from 6 vs 6 to 5 vs 5 PvP light experience. I say light experience because they didn't even fully commit to being competitive with the lack of tournament features in the game, still when compared to other top titles like Valorant. The fact with Overwatch 2 was that free to play now was a nice cushion for some of the criticism it was facing, but things were only going to get worse for the game. Things would worsen for Overwatch 2 concerning their professional scene, or the OW the Overwatch League. In December of 2022, Al's Philly team, Fusion, I still can't believe this happened. relocating to Korea as a Korean team in Seoul. 
Now this might seem like an incredibly random for people not following the owl, which is most people. It's but big during in Korea. the pandemic, as I covered in my first video concerning Overwatch 1, the professional scene for Overwatch 1 was in turmoil. The entire premise of the league was to be like a traditional sports league, where major cities would have their own teams that must be. It would work if they tried to make this game more competitive. A team but... slot to make a team. As much as many outlets would like to fluff the story for Activision Blizzard concerning the pandemic being the culprit for the esport dying, the truth is that the esport was never really alive in the first place. It was a forced esport that was artificially created. Activision Blizzard never let Overwatch grow competitively, organically. And the best times were in the original beta, because this is the time that we were organizing our own tournaments and doing things grassroots. When only a fraction of your population plays ranked, and even then a smaller fraction who does competitive gaming or watches it, it's going to be hard to build this entire traditional sports-like league concept. Jesus. Especially when esports is online and trying to force local brand appeal into esports, it just doesn't really make sense. It straddles on borderline delusion when you realize that Activision Blizzard was promising its investors $125 million in revenue by 2020. That money was nowhere in sight. And viewership numbers had been on this steady decline minus the launch event of Overwatch 2 itself naturally. Yet franchise slots were still costing $20 million. Yeah. Where was the money? Where were the viewerships? Because it wasn't in esports and it certainly wasn't in Overwatch. The reason that Fusion transitioning to Korea is a nice place. I'm just watching the place. Is that because the majority of the professional players and the general player base in Overwatch are Korean and in Korea. It means that the entire premise of the Owl in the U.S. and the EU, where they have this massive, important sponsorships and investors set up, it's basically becoming null and void. With competition moving to Korea for better pay and opportunities. I actually yeah. think that Activision Blizzard yeah. could kind of save the esports scene slightly by just leaning into this and creating an online GSL-like league like StarCraft had. I mean, can we point out more of the absurdity about the whole copy traditional sports thing? You might be thinking, like, oh, a Philly team moving to Korea. Wow, that sounds like a TV show-worthy experience, except that the team is freaking Korean. <laughs> But that's probably just a coincidence, right? What about my hometown city, the Houston Outlaws? Ah, okay. So best case scenario, <laughs> Overwatch 2's eSport is still kicking, technically, just in Korea. At this point, it feels like Activision Blizzard just doesn't want to take their ball and go home for fear of that walk of shame. Because it's one thing to be optimistic, but when you don't have any results, it starts to tend towards delusion. Oh. Which is what I'm inclined to believe personally. I spoke about Overwatch as an esport in my previous Death of a Game, and to quickly address my personal beliefs on such, given my history with the game, I think Overwatch might have had the potential to become an esport, had they let the game grow organically. I agree. This is not just important in developing a scene who plays or watches the game, but also in developing the appropriate rule sets and game modes that people prefer. Instead, we were kind of all shoehorned into running with default modes that the game came with, that they ended up kind of removing for the second game, by the way. And these modes weren't really suited for competitive play. No other major shooter has them. And then there's this whole information overlord problem that I told you guys about previously, especially as a tank player who made it to top 500. For the vast majority of people watching Overwatch at a competitive, let alone pro level, they have no idea what's going on, even for experienced players. There's so many particle effects on screen and things going on between 12 players that it's overwhelming for the majority of players. When you compare this to traditional sports, it's a world of difference. You know that in basketball, when the ball lands in the hoop, it's a bingo. You get the idea. That's why Activision Blizzard was better off comparing esports to the UFC or MMA or something more avant-garde and less mainstream that had more unique rules and formats. How the UFC, as a lifelong martial artist who's been watching it since 2004, went about advertising to a broader audience was taking highly skilled and experienced commentators and having them break things down over time. Over the course of many years, this led to a, just a higher general education. The issue with Overwatch was actually concerning commentators, which, sure, there were some good ones like Reinforce, who was there since the inception of the game, playing competitive lobbies with us, so I know he had a high level of skill and knowledge, but the majority were just fans who didn't particularly understand the game very well. That's again, because most players playing Overwatch don't. Overwatch feels like you're playing TF2 That's or That's an interesting Mobile thing to in say. Cases, or even I, I don't know if... I don't know. I, I can't. I think this is more speculation. I can't really comment because I know it's a lot of the casters and stuff, and I think they do go out of their way to educate the game. Um, I I don't know. I don't. Know. I can't really comment on that. I don't know. Been a classic competitive shooter, but the reality is you're playing a team-based game built on being a team plays game. That was. I, I will built say that it, it doesn't seem like like competitiveness has never been the priority for for Overwatch or the community building. It's never really been the priority. Never. the precipice of being an even more team-based game originally. 
but it's still built for being a team-based game. It's actually one of the most snowball-y games I've ever played because of the way it focuses on team fighting and team movement That's so true. much. Any top level player can back me up on this, but in Overwatch 1, once the first point was taken, if that team was able to wipe or charge their alts, it basically meant that if they were any good, GG for the second point, and this carried all the way up to uh, pro level play. Overwatch 2 had this idea of reducing the amount of combatants to help combat problems of clarity and curb the balance in some ways. For example, reducing really the amount depends of on how you won that first fight, right? To speed the game up and solve the problem of too many shields and too many. Like things. if you win first fight really fast, and it depends on who does what and which ults. Like again, it's not like a universal thing, but it definitely could happen. You had to set up a snowball, though, right? Just because honestly, they've done so much balancing up and down on the game. It is important to do that. I will acknowledge. Which way it goes, except them just reworking some characters, which just ended up feeling like weird because well, the game was still trying to appeal to casual players, so. Getting rid of Cassidy's flashbang just seems kind of strange. But I want to focus on what happened to the Overwatch formula itself. When a player was removed, specifically the tank, this not only reduces the amount of players, it reduces the amount of frontline presence and helps the other tanks and players. This makes it not only hard to play a tank in Overwatch 2, it means that it's harder for your team to play around a bad tank too. So a good tank is way more powerful, period. Tanks and Overwatch are initiated. I just don't they like playing it. decide most of the time how the fight is started, especially with ults, and sometimes how it ends. It was hard playing as a tank in solo queue in 6 versus 6 because you had to coordinate with your team. Now imagine in 5 versus 5, if you're out of position, it means you're dead. And that means big problems for your team. While I personally like the change overall, I think for the large percentage of the population, it wasn't a very good change. The idea of making Overwatch 2 less overpowered with abilities is something that I talked about slightly in my previous videos, and focusing more on the competitive aspects kind of makes sense in a sense, but not at this point, because all it does is further the problem of increasing the DPS queues, and the problem that the game already has regarding the flow of the game. Hmm. It feels like you're doing backwards more. more, but where are you going at this point? I know that sounds strange, again, because I wanted the game to be more competitive with less of these over. Oh, he's so down to that mech. But at this point, Blizzard already has nerfed the vast majority of hitscan in the game, and even completely nerfed some of the hitscan characters like Cassidy. The game is much slower as a result of many of these changes, which make the switch to 5 versus 5 feel like a band-aid fix, or one that they weren't even fully done implementing. And I know they did they it definitely, too, because there they, was the problem. They, they definitely were not done implementing it, right? Like, like there were a ton of heroes that would have needed to be, like, the snipers that just got changed in Season 5, Roadhog in Season 2 that came out of nowhere the second they put Kiriko in the game. Like, they definitely weren't done changing things. Which, again, I... I my, this has been my big point about 5v5. In your list of things that you would have said to fix Overwatch 1, would 5v... Going, making the game 5v5 even been on your... Let's say top 5. Top 10... No, it, I, it, it wouldn't have even been on the top 10 things you could do to fix the game. So in, in my mind, I am pretty convinced at this point that 5v5 was just a change for the sake of change to make it look like a new game for Overwatch 2. That's my conclusion. That's what I've come to, right? I'm not, I, I again, as someone who prefers 6v6, this is just my preference. I'm not saying, oh, it has to be this way, that way. Right? It's just my preference, right? Like, I challenge anyone in the comments to tell me what other reason would there have been to go from 6v6 to 5v5 in a game that was already super well received? And the only reason people didn't like 6v6 was because they never balanced double shield properly. They gave the shield tanks, right, that had ranged poke, the best sustain abilities in the game too. And I refer to Yidl's cycle of comps video where like, okay, if you're set up in a bunker S comp with Sig and Orisa, right, what should beat you is like basically a dive comp or something that lets you jump over. And when you get on top of these characters, that's when you should have the advantage. But because Sigma has grass, which is unpierceable by most of the characters, and Arissa Fortify, you couldn't headshot her anymore, and she got insane tankiness. Whenever that you you actually got on top of them, they still had better brawl abilities than you did. Not to mention if you stacked those characters with a hero like Brigida and Baptiste. Right, that had immortality and break and heal everybody with Inspire. Like, like they never, from a game design perspective, sat down and fixed double shield comps properly. Which is why, even throughout all of Overwatch One's lifespan, the ease it was so easy to get that corny value just by picking the heroes it won for you. Right, and they never sat down and fixed it. They never tried. They never did it right. Right, so. The game goes to 5v5, and yeah, it fixes that problem, but it's a band-aid fix. It's not like you never sat down and really fixed it. So it, it, that's just my opinion on it. Like, I, 
I, I don't see any reason. Like, would the, if, if Overwatch 2 had never come out, would this game have gone to 5v5? And I think the answer to that is no. Problem of there being too many shields and too many tanks, and well, the part of the whole problem of lack of knowledge of the game was because in Overwatch 1, you're supposed to actually shoot at the shields a lot of the time. Despite that not being fun. So you shoot at Ryan's shield and it goes down. And then he's Overwatch vulnerable. Two, now there wasn't a shield problem. But now tanks barely felt like they could take care of their team. And that was either a good thing depending on the kind of tank player you were. Or a bad thing. Overwatch 2 would introduce their Season 3, February 27, 2023. With this season would be the introduction of a new quarterly battle pass. The workshop, which would now allow for custom mapping and some new mythic skins. Producer Jared Noose was dismissive slightly of fans clamoring for different game modes, expressing a need and desire to focus and balance and fix what was already currently there. The problem Jared's is, bio, is that's that funny. you released a new game, so people are going to be expecting new content, right? The first true major season, arguably, was season 4 with the introduction of a new hero support in Lifeweaver, a new fan-made map thanks to the workshop and a few other bells and whistles. Season 4 felt like the perfect place for Overwatch 2 to be building momentum. It was problematic that they still hadn't brought in their I thought Life Viewer was really boring actually as a time game, to further hurting their ranked population. But looking back, April seemed like a good month for Overwatch 2 overall. They should stop making heroes like Life Viewer, that's my hot take. What would have happened the following month. Make it a shooter game. A dagger of an announcement would hit the web May 16th, 2023. Overwatch 2's PvE hero mode with the RPG-like missions and progressions and talent tree system would be cancelled. Keller explained that the hero mode had been in development since Overwatch's launch in 2016 and that it apparently was part of the vision the team had for Project Titan, the cancelled FPS MMO from which Overwatch was born. Like the article states, the hero mode was a remnant of Project Titan, and it being cancelled was Keller and the team putting to bed the dream of Project Titan period. The game director Keller basically stresses in his public statements that concerning the cancellation that they had evaluated it and that it was just too difficult to do, and too difficult to do while maintaining development on the other part of the game. Now if I left my journalistic integrity or just general integrity where the writer of this article at The Verge and many other journalists left theirs, which is making excuses for a billion dollar corporation fumbling a launch and product, then yeah, I would just leave it there. But I won't. That's and facts. Fact, that's why I made this video. Overwatch 2 and Activision Blizzard with the help of many diehard fans and an army of media lining up for the scoop has controlled the narrative. Dude. I have already gotten comments on my so stuff sick. about it too. Comments saying, well, they always said that they were going to charge for the other PvE content missions. So they aren't doing anything wrong and didn't necessarily cancel the PvE, right? The idea is Archives that the Blizzard or Team 4 is just a small moving team. It's an indie team who struggles with game development, resources, and talent. And that they couldn't do the things that they really wanted to do. And we should just accept that, that they're going to do their best going forward. Except they aren't a small team. And they aren't struggling in resources. <laughs> and the truth is, they lied to everybody. And sold us a game that wasn't complete and was in early access. Now they are pivoting to what content they can deliver on and they're trying to control the narrative that it's not that bad. Or, or at least the fan base and the media are doing it for them. But for reference, the hero missions in hero mode was reportedly going to be hundreds of missions. The meat of the PvE mode. Them still releasing more story content isn't getting people excited, or shouldn't, because their previous story content at events hasn't even been that impressive anyway. And unless it's a strong Real? departure from that, what are players really expecting? The following month, in June of 2023, Activision Blizzard would announce the paid story content portions at the Xbox Games Showcase. According to Game Informer, three missions would be released, and each of them would take up to 30 minutes to complete. The pricing would be $15 at the entry level, making it $15 for according to a game journalist's level of skill and play, which, take that with a grain of salt, would be an hour <laughs> and a half wrong. worth of story content. This is coming off the announcement of them cancelling the content they had promised their audience, which was despite what weird mental gymnastics you do because the said story missions were always going to cost extra, well that content wasn't supposed to cost anything. And it's not a good look to be charging for it still. It makes it feel like not only did they not deliver on the content and promises that they made, aka failed as a business with their customers, they are still trying to monetize the remnants instead of doing the moral thing and releasing those for free due to cancelling the majority of the whole reason they announced a second game in the first place. Well, unless they want to argue that, well, it's not because of that and it was actually because of monetization at this point. With moves like this, it's hard not to feel that way, right? And I know the comments are coming regardless of how much logic and non-bootlicking I do. But they could have used the story missions as a moment to write their wrong, right? It's not like we requested and they maybe would do hero mode. No, they promised that they would do it, 
and they didn't do it. Instead, they found more ways to continue to monetize on the same schedule no matter how utterly tone deaf they were due to delivering a subpar product that was missing a key feature they promised. Remember guys, that's who you are defending. Not wrong. Season 5 for Overwatch 2 would continue on Not June wrong. 13th, 2023. This season would finally bring the much needed competitive matchmaking changes and balancing, such as solo queue players not being placed into multi queue games. The weird part of Season 5 is despite being a rather good update overall, as it's basically balancing and matchmaking focus, something that should be arguably fixed in a launched product, right? Is Activision Blizzard wanting a pat on the back for bringing back a feature, the on-fire system? Somebody mentioned this in my podcast and I thought it was a joke, but seriously, it's right there on the patch notes. So bug fixes, balancing, matchmaking fixes, wanted for months. Doesn't seem like a good answer to the criticism that the game was facing concerning the content either though. And then wanting a pat on the back for bringing back a feature that the old version of the game had just seemed tone deaf once again. And if anything, it begs the question more and more, how finished was Overwatch 2 really, right? When you're constantly balancing your heroes and after basically slightly overhauling your game in the first place, it speaks to the fact that you either adopted a new vision and are trying to adapt to it, or you lost your lead hero developer and don't have the same vision or eye for things that maybe he did. Whatever it is, still the changes were needed, clearly. But that doesn't do much to help in bringing in new players or even in players who already left. And to me, the thought of getting them to spend $15 for a few hours of story content just seemed like a hard proposition. So perhaps with the failure of PvE before ever launching, Overwatch 2 can still manage to somehow fix its balance issues and the <laughs> aforementioned issues in competitive play, including a, a lack of tournaments in the game, and salvage whatever is left of their player base and be a fun alternative team-based shooter to other projects such as CSGO and Valorant and COD, and so on and so forth. But I think that the days of Overwatch being a serious competitor, whether in actual competitive experiences, or merely popularity, are numbered. Yeah, I, I mean, agree. That's why I did this video, right? I a agree. Point that I felt worth mentioning. I, I think that's a good point to make. I, I Again, I, I don't know, man. Uh, before we transition to solving the case was that the public perception and image of Activision Blizzard was just tarnished at this point. When Overwatch 1 was being developed, not only the team for the team behind it have classic developers and enacted nostalgia and really just belief in the product that they were going to make, the game had that old Blizzard feel still too. With Overwatch 2, Activision Blizzard isn't even the same company. Many of their founders, let alone key developers, have fled the company, and the head honcho in charge is quite hated by many people publicly and behind closed doors. This is going off of hundreds of comments that I received when I asked for fans' perspectives on Overwatch 1 and 2, and Activision Blizzard, and the drama surrounding all of them I got so many examples I couldn't even fit into this video. I mean, for example, shout out to Ool, who talked about NetEase and Blizzard's 14-year relationship falling through. Or all the other dramatic stories that I was told, like the Blitzchung thing. There's just too many to even fit into this video, sorry guys. And not just from journalists either, but also from diehard passionate fans of the game, expressing their feelings of betrayal that they had for a company that they grew up with essentially. It's hard to imagine Activision Blizzard being able to effectively or easily transition from this failure without doing some serious house cleaning or reflecting publicly. Because behind the scenes reflecting isn't good enough anymore. If Activision Blizzard wants us to believe that they can still do the same quality, they have to show it to us. But it's disheartening to see so many emails telling me that it's one thing to have them fail at so many hurdles, but it's more that they just can't trust the company themselves to do things morally, ethically, or in the best interest of the game. God, I that wanted that ability. Trust. And that's a hard thing to mend. And sometimes, you never really can. Blizzard really did become Activision Blizzard and then some. The Arthas of their own story. What a shame, dude. The music is playing and I have spent more time than usual on such a short timeline, but I think we can say that Overwatch 2 was a special case, right? But a case nonetheless. So let's put it to rest. What are the largest contributing factors for the game? Let's see failing? what he says. Blizzard would cancel the hero mode. Yes. Over monetized and under delivered. Yes. The majority of the original and top talent fled. Maybe. The, maybe. I, I, maybe. Overwatch 2 is just half baked. Yes. The competitive scene has floundered. Yes. Blizzard has tanked their likability past the point that whenever they made new announcements, people were just making memes about it. Overwatch 2 still exists. Okay. Everybody. I'm well aware of it. I, I, I think he's right about like most of those. The 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 talent fleeing again, I I, 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 to be fair, and about Kaplan and Goodman is their their design model was not going to work in a competitive shooter either way. 
Like I've talked about their design model countless times. And this is what Jeff Kaplan directly told me when I asked him in a QA. and a He said their goal was to make a very complicated, intricate game and make it easier over time. But what made Overwatch so special in the shooter genre was how difficult and unique all these characters were, like Genji and heroes like that that had an insanely high skill ceiling and a low skill floor, which means they had a long grind to actually achieve levels that seemed almost infinite, right? Like, But they continued to add heroes that just beat that in a very gimmicky BS way, like Moira versus Genji or Brig as a hero, right? And they kept doubling down on making characters like that. So I think this game's, like popularity would have been the fate was sealed on that regardless i though it wouldn't have done the damage that like overwatch 2 would have done obviously um because the game was still fairly popular in 2020 before they stopped making content for it right um but yeah I, again I, I think he's right for most of it it's it's the the over promising and over monetizing and under delivering the cancellation of the hero mode just spot on on those points um and it's just it's just a shame it's just a shame and likely will still exist a until activision blizzard is done squeezing more money out of it yeah now i have no desire to return to that game or don't really see a path forward for them past being quite the niche title because i think pulling a final fantasy 14 which is what people constantly echo in my comments anytime a game fails takes humility in admitting that you messed up and nothing about overwatch 2 feels that way because then they would have to essentially admit it was done largely for monetization reasons hence the major degradation in quality and expectation i'm inclined to believe I that agree. some developers would rather leave than even have to talk about that and they probably did but i digress detectives we must move on to the next case no matter how personally invested into this one we might be because games and companies are always dying and we need to find out why thanks for watching the time shall come. I mean, honestly, a great video. I, I think he summarized it pretty well throughout most of this and its lifespan. I mean, look, you know, I, I think that the biggest blunder Overwatch 2 had is, or even Overwatch in its lifespan. I'm just going to call it Overwatch because that's what Overwatch 2 is. It's just Overwatch. It's not a new game. It's just Overwatch. It's an Overwatch update, right? They failed, they, they created a, an insanely competitive scene that could have flourished, and they designed characters away from that. They appealed to an audience that's not competitors, that when more competitive games came out, um, that ended up being like Fortnite, like Valorant, right? A bunch of people just jumped ship for better opportunities on those sides. Uh, the casual side of the player base was let down because, again, you know, the content of the game stopped coming out just for something to end, end up getting canceled anyway. Uh you know, you, it's just sad, man. Like, I, I loved Overwatch so much, and I wish it the best, of course, but you know, this is kind of the big reason why I left the game. You know, I, I don't see it being an industry standard title. And it had a chance. Not only did it have a chance to do that, it actually did do that, right? But when Fortnite came in and innovated and all these other things, Blizzard was too slow and Activision was too slow to respond. Um, and that's just because of a lot of the internal stuff going on in the company, I guess. And, you know, when you see a company blow up the way that it is, this company has, you know, I'm not going to finger point at certain individuals because there's just no point in doing that, pun intended. Uh, but it's just, it just sucks. You know, it, it is what it is. I, I, I'm not emotionally invested in it anymore. I've, I'm, I'm working on Mindplex and kind of doing this stuff on my own. And, you know, I, I've learned what I've had to learn from, from people's success and failures around me and, and, and paying close attention. And there's definitely a lot to learn in Overwatch's case. Um, it's just sad. It really was the greatest shooter ever made. And I think that the, the immersiveness of the, it's still the most immersive shooter ever made. And I think it has a chance, but I, I, I don't think that this game can become something great under Activision Blizzard. It just can't. It just can't. They've had their chance. They've blown it every opportunity they have, uh, whether it be from lack of funding or Kotic or whoever you want to blame. At this point, it doesn't matter whose fault it is. It's just it is what it is, right? And it happens in the world. Sometimes you swing and hit. Sometimes you miss. And, you know, for me personally, I'm going to hold 2016 to 2018 Overwatch very close to my heart. Um, but after two years, it just had to innovate, and it didn't. And it, in fact, backtracked constantly with the new heroes that were coming out, like Brig and Moira and double shield never being fixed and this cancellation of content and yeah it's just it's just sad to see something so fantastic just get completely and utterly dumpstered for the sake of monetization that's i'll say i'll say what it was i mean the monetization aspects of the new game came out and the features of the new game did not so that's just where we're at with activision blizzard as a company kind of sounds a lot like warzone 2.
No surprise. So yeah, that's the death of the game, Overwatch. I think it was a well-made video. Um, pretty accurate for the most part. And uh, yeah, let me know what you guys think down in the comments. Appreciate the watch. See y'all later. Peace out.